Oh, hello. Welcome once again to Speakeasy with Paul F. Tompkins. I'm still Paul F. Tompkins, and joining me today, you will recognize him from The State, Viva Variety, Reno 911, and currently, Sean Saves the World. Please say hello to Thomas Lennon. Tom, thank you for being here. Slantra. Cheers. Slantra. Slantra. Both That's for the right. homies who aren't here. I might be a harder drinker than you usually have on the show. Well, there's, no, there's, no, there's no limit to these, right? I mean, oh, no, it's bottomless. Oh, it's bottomless. Yes, oh. it's bottomless. Any, anytime you need a oh, warm-up, right. let us know. I'm getting close. Absolutely. I did a film called Hancock. Uh, about uh, uh, Will Smith. Will Smith. He's a superhero. Uh -huh. He's not so into it. <laughs> mm -mm. He's a reluctant superhero. You, you probably find yourself saying, hey, Tom, how'd you end up in Hancock? I was just, who was I just saying this to? How did Tom Lennon end up at Hancock? And now here you are, the man himself. Johnny Galecki and I, Johnny Galecki from a television show called The Big Bang Theory, mm -hmm. we were cast as like slick ad executives in Hancock. And we had this huge scene. Oh my God, that's right. This huge scene where we pitch Hancock to put a Nike logo on the moon. Now, here's something you can learn about Hollywood kids. A couple months go by from when we're cast and they make us the deals. They're like, guys, you've got this amazing scene where you're pitching Will Smith to put a Nike swoosh on the moon. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, arrive on set two months later over at the Sony lot, and uh, Pete Berg, the director, comes in, and he starts uh, assigning lines of dialogue to all of the, the background actors in the room, mm -hmm. giving nothing to me or Galecki at all. And we ask one of the producers, we're like, does anybody know what's going on here? And they're like, oh, guys, your whole storyline's been cut. Uh, you're not in the film at all anymore. Um, I can't believe we forgot to tell you this. Just We just cut that. We cut it. It's not how, how did you even get on the set? Well, we were, we just <laughs> forgot. It was just like big movies like that. You know, they're, they're like an aircraft carrier. It's hard to sure. kind of maneuver. Sure. So people just forgot mm -hmm. that they'd cut our whole storyline. They kept us on the call sheet and, and kept us in the credits. And uh, in the final version of the film, I, uh, I say, they, they threw us a bone. And here's what I say, That's Hancock, nice. you owe me a phone call. <laughs> and um, so that was, that was great. Uh, although the film went on to make $600 million worldwide. Was it? Oh, but not mm -hmm. here it didn't do so well. Right? No, 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 no. Dreadful flop. But around the world, they don't get, they just like stuff moving around. Sure. You know, there's a happy ending, mm -hmm. which is I forgot I was in Hancock because I'm almost not in it. <laughs> Something about your presence in Hancock mm -hmm. that seems to escape people. One day, a check in the mail comes for $11,000 for saying, Hancock, you owe me a phone call. call. So it's the two gestures, it's yeah. the phone, mm -hmm. and then the point. I didn't crush it. <laughs> I did not crush it. You've had some uh, great uh, movie stories. You have a great, you have a, the sneakiest appearance, mm -hmm. because you appear in a different era. That's right. I'm talking There Will Be Blood. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That one really sneaks up on people. Yeah, really don't blink. Yeah. You'll miss me and There Will Be Blood. But to comedy fans, you just ruined that movie. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Ruin it, because all of a sudden it's like, I'm gonna say something serious, and there's goofy uh, PFT over there. Do you think it's as jarring as when you saw, first saw Bob Odenkirk in uh, Breaking Bad? Oh, it it literally, they might as well have had Oscar the Grouch come in. <laughs> I was like, this is as plausible as like, ah, blah, blah, blah. It's like, this is crazy. You really, I had no idea he was gonna be in that show. No, not at all. And I was, and what is it, the yeah. second season, towards the end of the second season? And yeah. It's like, this is an amazing show. Yeah. And all of a sudden, what? What, what are you doing come here? On. Yeah. I could, that, that could be me. Yeah. I thought you were better than this. <laughs> and then he's won like a bunch of Emmys probably too, hasn't he? You are a, an author. Uh, you and uh, uh, Ben Grant. Mm -hmm. But your book was about screenwriting. Screenwriting. Because you and Ben have written uh, several successful. We've written about 11 films. Some. Is it 11? Yeah, egregious flops. A bunch. But yes. some huge successes. A couple of huge hits. The Night at the Museum films. Mm -hmm. uh, the Pacifier. Yep. Um, uh, you wrote Her Herbie Fully Loaded. Yep. Um, Got yeah. fired because we wouldn't make the, the car smile. It was a huge argument with Disney. I've heard this story before. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Totally that, true. Uh, and now I think back, I'm like, well, we were assholes. Make the, make the car smile. <laughs> Who cares? Here's my feeling. My feeling is that writing studio movies, you are not, you're not necessarily an artiste. Mm -hmm. uh, creating works of art. If you're writing for the studios, now by the way, you can write independent films and make the most beautiful, quiet movies that make people sad. I'm excited for that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, but if you write for the studios, you are basically a contractor. Right. And they have asked you to build them a house. Mm -hmm. And they will want certain things to go certain places. And, and it's also a job that if you can get it twice, 
amazing. If you can get that studio writing job three times, miracle. Four times, crazy. It's it's impossible. They love firing writers because they hate you. Right. Um, They're clearly the problem. Yeah, of course. Yeah. They hate you. They're so, well, you're also so easy to fire as the writer. Right. They just call it fresh eyes. Fresh eyes is the actual expression. We'll Whenever it's not going well, we're putting fresh eyes on it. Yeah. Fresh eyes. I'm like, fuck it. I have fucking eyes. What are you talking about? <laughs> fresh eyes. First time we heard that, we were bummed. Later, we learned if they fire you and they hire somebody else, celebrate that. Mm -hmm. That means the movie's closer to being made. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a sure sign. What What's very scary is if they fire you but don't replace you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. The movies, you're dead. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you're dead. At what point did you feel like you you understood this is the way it works the system. and I'm not yeah. taking it personally anymore? Uh, that takes a little while and mm -hmm. it truly is an art that you have to master. Mm -hmm. Being able to let it go. Right. Yeah. But this is not a judgment on me no. as a human being. Any, anything you make, right. whether it's for a studio or whether it's an independent thing, whether it's your own, mm -hmm. it's you on a stage, you're, you're, you're putting something out there, mm -hmm. and if it doesn't go the way that you thought it was going mm -hmm. to go, it's very difficult not to feel judged in some way. Well, the bigger bummer is when it goes exactly the way you thought it was going to go, and people still hate it. <laughs> Which right. is like, that's more the story of my right. life. <laughs> it's like, like, people, like ta I wrote the movie Taxi with Jimmy Fallon and Queen Latifah. That right. movie tested through the roof. Right. People were bonkers for, woo, Queen Latifah, Jimmy Fallon, go. <laughs> Drive a crash of super taxi around. <laughs> and like literally almost ended our writing career. You ever had to act in a real situation where it's like people don't know that you're It's the worst thing in the world. I hate it. I it's, hate it. It's the worst. And they're like, just don't just act like it's it's normal. Don't even care. Yeah, yeah just go in, nobody will care, just do it. It's it's always We're a, gonna steal a shot. Yeah. It's always yeah. a that's easy for you to say. Scenario, oh, of course, of course. Like, yeah, just over get there. in there. <laughs> like, yeah, just go in and order the thing and it's okay, I'll buy a hoagie. Just go be weird. We want yeah. to get real reactions from people. Like, <laughs> oh, no. no, fuck you. That's awful. <laughs> I actually, I, 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 I tip my hat to like Knoxville and Sasha Cohen, who can do that Look, kind of stuff. Look, if, if you, <laughs> you want to, I just, I just you want to, to feel be icky. in your thirties yeah. and you have to urinate through a catheter. Hey, good for you. God love you. <laughs> go in peace. Acting is kind of <laughs> icky anyway, right. you know. But then like pranking people who don't know what's going on. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I guess I'm glad that stuff like that exists. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that it's 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 good that there's somebody out there that's doing that sort of thing. Sure, sure. If only so that we can talk about it. Sure. But I certainly I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> no, I cannot do it. <laughs> you're a sensitive guy. Yeah. Uh, you you're a big fan of Morrissey. One of the biggest. One of the yeah. biggest. Yes. I would. I would, you'd be hard pressed to be a bigger Morrissey fan than me. I would say. Uh, I, I, I got to meet. I met Morrissey once. How was that? It's interesting because you love him so much, as if you're me, and he gives you back not very much. Right. But so I certainly kind of flirted with him mm -hmm. uh, a little bit. He was at the Cat and Fiddle where he hangs out all the time now, but yes. I didn't know this. A couple years ago, I, no one knew this. Mm -hmm. And I saw him and I, I we were dressed identically. <laughs> we were dressed absolutely identically. Sure. And we had uh, the thing and the yeah. thing, and he was like, oh, yeah, so look at this. <laughs> Here comes another one. Um, but so. I literally, I, to get his autograph, I literally knelt down. Like, I, literally like I was meeting Absolutely. the Pope. And I said, Mr. Morrissey, because he has a first name. Sure. Um, Stephen, and, and I said, Mr. Morrissey, would it be at all possible to get your autograph? And he, he, did, he went like, oh God, look at this, you poor thing. But I was certainly flirting a little bit, and he sort of flirted back a little bit, and it was very exciting. The other autograph I asked, I've, only, I've never asked people for autographs, mm -hmm. Tom Waits. Oh, well, sure. Yeah. He's, a, he's not somebody that you see out in the wild that much. Can I tell you something about asking Tom Waits for an autograph? Sure. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> did you get that autograph? I sure did. But he was not happy about oh, it. Oh, he was walk, uh, sitting on Melrose at the Johnny Rockets on Melrose, mm -hmm. and uh, Tom Waits walks by, and I'm like, when the fuck is Tom Waits going to walk by me again? This right. is, oh my God, you're slide all the way. This is crazy. <laughs> so I was like, I'm doing it. I had, happened to have a pen, and there's a piece of paper, and I walked up to him, and as I started walking towards him, Tom Waits says, Make it quick. <laughs> that was the opener. Make it quick. And I was like, I, I certainly will. Mr. Waits, may I have your autograph? Um, to which the response was, what are you going to do with it? Terrific question. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with it? Sure. I said, I'm going to put it on my bulletin board next to Morrissey. And that seemed to be okay with him. And he did sign it. They have an understanding. They seem to, they seem to obviously. Obviously, yeah. a mutual uh, <laughs> admiration said the society. magic words. <laughs> I think it certainly confused him a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Um, but yeah, don't ask, don't ask Tom Waits for his autograph. Fair enough. He was, he was so annoyed. Oh God, he couldn't have been more annoyed. Did his pork pie hat fly up in the air? <laughs> the steam, steam, steam yeah. came out of it. And his bindle just <laughs> <laughs> He had a, I should have mentioned he had a bindle, of course. <laughs> I, I want to ask you very quickly. Um, you are a, you're a dad. Mm -hmm. you know, how old is your son now? Four. Four years old. Yeah. Um, is that something that you always saw as happening in your life? Because uh, you know, it, back to the days of the state, mm -hmm. that was a crazy time in mm -hmm. comedy. Yeah. There was a lot of we're we're kind of from the same graduating yeah. class. There was 100%. a lot of yeah. lot of crazy people. Yeah. A lot of crazy stuff happening. Yeah. You, you're part of this gigantic for a sketch group. Yeah, we're Gigan big. You were like yeah. a polyphonic spree of sketch. Yeah, and we fight all the time. All we do is fight. <laughs> Literally, all we do is and fight. You, we're fighting right now. Yeah, you guys, you yeah. all still work together in various capacities. And, and fight together. Yeah, yeah. and fight together. Yeah. Did you ever see yourself as being a dad? I, you know, I didn't. Uh, I didn't, but that's probably because I was on so much ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs children? In fairness. When joy is all around when you. When you've got actresses uh, with daddy issues and, sure. and ecstasy and sure. things like that. There was there was a great, the 90s were an amazing. There's celibate pop stars to flirt with. Oh, <laughs> there was so much. My, my book, my my book was full. Um, <laughs> no, didn't certainly, certainly didn't plan on it. Mm -hmm. um, didn't think about it for a long time. And uh, everything everybody says is true, which is it's uh, parenting is exactly 95% really amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you literally you weep every day, and you're like oh, I took my son to Disneyland, mm -hmm. and like it's so fun to shit on Disneyland as an adult. You're like, eh, it's small world, it's stupid, and that's stupid. <laughs> you know, um, until you go with a little child, and then you just watch them watch stuff, and you just literally I walked around. I think people when they saw me at Disneyland with my son thought I've just been diagnosed with a terminal disease. I'm never gonna see this boy again. Because I was just literally walking around, just literally just looking at like street lamps wrapped like candy cane. And he'd go, wow. And I'd go, ah, God, <laughs> oh, God, it does look like a candy cane. Um, no, so it's 95% wonderful, 5% just the fucking worst. Just so fucking terrible. You want to ma literally mail them. You want to put them in a box right. and mail them to Spain. Mm -hmm. General delivery. And say, you figured this out. <laughs> but that's only 5% of the time. That's Nine, not bad. Yeah, 95% of the time it's terrific. That's not bad. 5% general delivery, Spain. Fucking oh, turn so it's in. not even express. No, no, general <laughs> delivery. Some, become someone else's problem. <laughs> well, but, I hope we all can become someone else's problem. Yes. Thomas Lennon, thank you very much for oh, joining us. Always a pleasure. Oh, you have a little bit left, otherwise it's bad luck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have some. That does it for this edition of Speakeasy. Please, don't look into my camera. Don't ever look into my camera. <laughs> that does it for this edition of Speakeasy. <laughs> Join us again next time when my guest will be a different person. I'll do one more of these still. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll still another, do one more. Another lager from Mr. Lennon. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and check back every Monday to see who I interview next. And for more info about Speakeasy, visit MadeMan.com.